votre ordinateur. Hello everyone. So I'm uh, Gabrielle Altit. I'm one of the neonatologists at the Montreal Children's Hospital. Um, welcome to this uh, workshop that we're organizing for the neonatal intensive care unit um, for uh, better training and better understanding of how the uh, defibrillator machine works, in which context you need to use it, uh, how to use it if you need to use it rapidly, and where it is, situation in, where it is situated in our current unit. Uh, we will also briefly review some of the PALS algorithm. Um, if you are using this video for training outside of uh, the Montreal Children and the NICU, um, just a disclaimer that um, you should always look at your protocol within your institution or care practices and that this uh, video is strictly to be used for informational purposes um, and that you should always follow the guidelines emitted by the uh, American Heart Association, the ILCOR, uh, the Neonatal Resuscitation Program, the PALS and the ACLS. So hopefully this um, little workshop will be useful and will allow you to have a better sense of how to use uh, these technologies that are potentially life-saving um, within the context of your practice. So first of all, I want to uh, show what I'm talking about uh, here. So we're talking about the defibrillator. Um, this workshop is also organized with the help of uh, Mrs. Julie Richet, who is our simulator coordinator at the Montreal Children's Hospital. Um, so we will start by just having a little view and review of where exactly the defibrillator is. So the defibrillator is usually situated in this area where you see the defibrillator. So you will see the side of the defibrillator exactly at that spot next to the ECG machine. So the defibrillator looks like this. It comes within our unit with the machine on top, which is being checked by the resuscitation uh, nurses. I will just suggest so that you can have a better view. Um, within the defibrillator, we usually will need uh, to use um, the, the pads or, sorry, the paddles or the pads, which are um, stickers that you can put on the chest of uh, the baby as well as on the back of the baby. So both of these uh, are quite useful as they, um, both of them can transmit uh, electricity. Um, in the context of a resuscitation or a need for resuscitation. Uh, some of them have advantages and we will try to discuss them. So just on a practical standpoint, you will see that um, within this um, drawers, at the last drawer, within this last drawer, you will find that there are other pads here. And so it's quite self-explanatory about how to open it. These pads connect to uh, a, specific, um, a specific cable. And this cable is always in the drawer with the pads. Why is this cable important? Is that as you can see, there is a green extension and this green extension will go actually here. So you have to twist and green goes to green. So if I would want to put the pads instead of the paddles, I would just have to push here, okay? So then once you have the cable, this cable can be connected to the pads Okay, and then here, your two pads are now connected to the machine. Okay, and the pads will tell you exactly where to put the actual pads. So you can see that this one goes on top and this one goes to the back. So you want to avoid having them touching each other, especially in smaller babies since um, you can have uh, electricity going through from one pad to another without passing through the baby. So this is for how to install the pads on the machine. And you can see that now it is connected. So if we want to go back to our paddles, we would have to twist and then put back the other green. And then these are the ones being connected 
So you can just pull. And so you can have your paddles. And then you can hold the phone and I'll, oh yeah, you got it, yes. And then for the kids, we want to use the smaller surface. So you will see often different practitioners have different practices. Uh, some of our cardiologist uh, colleague will prefer the paddles and they will often want to use what we call the sandwich technique. Um, I'll just put a disclaimer. There's no data showing out there that sandwich techniques versus the conventional technique uh, adds an advantage. Um, so in the context of a situation of emergency, use the technique that is um, to be uh, the easiest for you. So typically we would need to add some of conducting gel and that's where you have to be extremely careful. It really has to be electrode conductive gel. So gel conductor. You cannot use any other gel or saline or ultrasound gel. This has to be the gel that you use. So you'd put gel on the pads. Yeah. And then on here, you have a few buttons, okay? And so if I wanna do a defibrillation, I can choose the amount of joules that I want. I can choose if it's a cardioversion or defibrillation, a cardioversion being um, synchronized. So let's say we don't. And then from here, I can charge by pressing on the yellow button. So I'll disarm and I'll show again. I can charge from here, disarm from there, or I can charge from here. It does the same. Okay. The button number three equals delivering the shock. You will be able to deliver the shock also by pressing simultaneously on the two orange dots. So for example, for this patient, we would want to be on top of the chest and on the side of the chest without having any of the electrical surfaces touching each other. Here you can see that the contact has been detected as being poor, obviously because this is not a human being that's passing electricity through it. And typically you would want to charge and eventually deliver a shock by pressing on both buttons at the same time. So this was just to orient you on um, how the defib machine is working. We're gonna stop the strip from um, actually uh, recording. So I wanna show a few other things on the machine. First of all, um, we can bring this a bit up. So first of all, on the machine, you're gonna find a few sectors. Number one, you have the screen in the middle. You have the energy selection and you have a few buttons that are here. This area is regarding pacing. We will talk about pacing in my presentation very soon. So if you go on AED, this means that you are on a mode of automatic external defibrillation. This is really calibrated for adults in the context of ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation without a pulse. In the context of pediatric and newborns, often the amount of uh, joules that you're gonna be administrating is much smaller. So you wanna be able to select the amount of joules that you're gonna put. So for example, if you wanna give a defibrillation with two joules per kilo and the patient is one kilo, you would select two joules. And then you can choose if you wanna do defibrillation, you need to have this option off. So an example, this is on, it means it's synchronized. This is off, it means it's not synchronized. So it's gonna be a defibrillation. You charge and you administer. You can change the amount of volume that the machine has. And this is often related to the rhythm that the machine will detect underlying. And you can start recording or stop recording by pressing on the strip button. We're not gonna go through some of the algorithms 
So I'm going to share my screen with some of the algorithms for regarding the defibrillation. So I want to talk about some of the cases. We'll review how, again, the defibrillator works. We're going to review the pulse algorithms for its use. And then you'll have my emails for questions. So think about a newborn admitted for bronchiolitis on the unit receiving intravenous fluid on CPAP. There's a premix bag adjusted overnight uh, due to hypokalemia. And then you're called by the bedside because the baby's apnea can found to be pulseless. So what do you do? So if you have this situation, you can see that the patient is actually in sinus rhythm. And actually, this patient has some pulses because the saturometer is able to pick up a pulse. But let's say you have this, you know, if a patient does not have a pulse, a saturation will never be picked up because the whole saturometer is based on the fact that it's picking up an arterial pulsation or capillary pulsation. So here, this patient has an erratic erratic tracing. And this erratic tracing is related to something called ventricular fibrillation. Fibrillation means that the actual electrical impulse is very erratic within uh, the myocardial structure. And you can see that you're not detecting any blood pressure, you're not detecting any saturation. And if you would try to find a pulse, you would not find a pulse in this patient. So the main aspect of the care for this baby is to really reintroduce a pulse um, or reachieve an autonomous pulse as quickly as possible to avoid tissue ischemia, to avoid brain ischemia. And often what will save this baby is two things. Number one, a defibrillation to try to restart and reset heart uh, electrical conduction. And number two, really creating a pulse in the meantime so that there's blood flow in the organs. And that's what we mean by CPR. Another uh, time where you can find a situation without a pulse is what we call ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia means what? It, it is this sawtooth appearance like this, where you have kind of these waves that are regular and that are large complex. This is a ventricular tachycardia. So two rhythms I want you to remember, completely erratic, not going anywhere is a ventricular fibrillation. And this is a ventricular tachycardia where you have these kind of big spikes that are regular. These two rhythms are associated with not having any pulse and with the requirement of a defibrillation to really restart um, the electrical uh, conduction of the heart. So again, I'm gonna give you the differences. This is a sinus rhythm where you have a P wave, a narrow, narrow QRS, and then a T wave. And this is a patient who has kind of a really erratic um, ventricular tachycardia rhythm um, that uh, has no pulse. So, we discussed already, there's two sides of hand-hand paddles, the adult and the infant size, you saw it. The paddles and the self adhesion pads are equally effective. Um, the infant size are for infants less than 10 kilos. So when we're looking at the paddles and you're removing um, your, and you're removing your, just wanna make sure it's filming, okay. So here is an example where um, I'm gonna stop sharing just to make sure that you can see. Okay, so uh, this is what we talk about when we say a paddle is um, uh, the infant side. So if you would have to put back the adult side. Right, close it. Off. Okay, this is the adult side and you can see that there's a little button on top and then you pull at the same time. Pull, yeah, there you go. And then you have the pediatric side on the other side. So quite easy. Well, the ones that we have here are really the 10 less than 10 kilo infants uh, for, for the paddles. So I'm gonna go back into the presentation So we talked about the self-adhering pads, pressing firmly on the chest so that the gel on the pad completely uh, touches the chest. Um, there's a 
uh, chest wall uh, electrode interface that is part of the self-adhesive pads and uh, you apply them uh, manually and you shouldn't put any saline or ultrasound gel or bear paddles or alcohol pads. You should really uh, just stick the two pads like we showed on uh, the mannequin. Um, there's no advantage in the interior posterior of the paddles, so the sandwich position. I'm personally not someone who feels comfortable using a sandwich position in a patient who has uh, potentially central lines, intubated, things like that. But then again, if another expert uh, is comfortable with that technique, it's always something that can be used. I prefer the technique where we aim the apex and the center chest. So we spoke about the three areas. Uh, this is a bit of a close-up. It's the same machine that we use. There's the energy selection. When you put your, um, your, your stickers or when you put your paddles, uh, the machine will detect a rhythm. And so uh, based on that, uh, we'll show you if it looks like a sinus rhythm or not. But there's a way also to uh, connect the machine to the electrodes uh, of the patient, and we will show that um, upcoming. So here are the example, again, of the paddles and the pads. Um, the pads are um, the ones, so here they show that they've angled towards the left ventricle, but in smaller babies, you can just put it on the back the same way uh, it shows on the sticker. You can also put it on the side if you have a bigger patient, but the importance is that they don't touch. Okay, so that's the example of, of two that should not be touching because the current is not going to go through the, the patient. So we already shown that is how to remove the big paddle from uh, the smaller paddles. So initially when we want to do a defibrillation and, and what is a defibrillation? It means that the machine is actually going to send uh, some voltages, um, some joules of energy, um, really unsynchronized to whatever underlying rhythm there is. So it's just going to emit electricity as soon as you're asking the machine to do it. It's like a bit like a shock électrique, like an electrical shock. It happens right away as soon as you press the button. And usually the first dose that we give is about two joule per kilo, uh, but the dose can be around two to four joule per kilo. And it's typically used for these chaotic rhythms that are not associated with a pulse. So an example would be ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation where you have no pulse. These are the only two rhythms that within the NICU context, you should be defibrillating patients um, and will allow you to uh, hopefully go back into a, a sinus rhythm. So if you have refractory ventricular fibrillation, then you can increase up to four joule per kilo. So I just wanted to show uh, one of the, rec the recent um, pediatric uh, cardiac arrest algorithm them. There was a renewal uh, in 2019, but uh, for the CPR, it's uh, the same concepts. So uh, as soon as you recognize that a patient is without a pulse, you should be starting CPR to reestablish uh, some circulatory uh, blood flow. Um, and then typically you need to look at, okay, if I don't have a pulseless arrest, do I have a situation that is shockable or do I have a situation that is not shockable? The shockable ones we just said is ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. As soon as you recognize that it's one of these rhythms, you should be looking at administrating a defibrillation. If it's a situation of asystole or any kind of other rhythm that we call pulseless electrical arrest, so if the patient looks in sinus tachycardia, but there's no pulse, if the patient looks in block, if the patient looks in uh, SVT, this is not a defibrillation that you should be giving, but you should start your CPR if there's no pulse. So here you administer your shock. The importance is that you should be right away after the shock, restarting your CPR. You shouldn't be looking for the rhythm right away after giving the shock, because what's gonna happen is that the heart is gonna be stunned. You're gonna give electricity, but you need to reestablish adequate ventricular function and perfusion. And so for that, the recommendation is that as soon as you administer defibrillation, you should be continuing two minutes of CPR. So you start your CPR, you recognize that the rhythm is shockable in the context of no pulse. It's ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. You wanna go on with your defibrillation. Um, so I'm going to go on with um, 
stopping the sharing here. And I want to reshow again on the machine. If you would have a patient that's, you know, let's say two kilos and you want to give a defibrillation because the patient is ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, you would turn number one, the machine. At two kilo, you would want at least four kilos. So you can aim for five because you know that the dose needs to be between two and four joule per kilo. And then you really just don't need to do anything. You need to charge and then eventually administer. So if these are connected, if the pads are connected to the machine, you will use the buttons here. If you want to use the paddles, then you can use the button here and then the buttons on top of the paddle. So we are going to continue with a case number two. So this is a patient who used official atresia. He has a pick line. You're being called at the bedside because the baby is becoming tachycardic. So you can see here that on your monitor, the patient actually has a pulse, it's setting at 100%, so it's detecting a pulse, but the patient has really sustained uh, tachycardia that looks very uh, narrow in terms of the QRS and very regular. So quite suspicious for an underlying supraventricular tachycardia with re-entry. So if the baby is stable versus if the baby is unresponsive, hypotensive, and poorly perfused, you might not have the same approach. A lot of these babies, if they're stable, you can monitor them and attempt some of the vagal maneuvers or attempt adenosine to try to uh, reestablish and, and, and the normal sinus rhythm and break their reentry mechanism. If the baby is unresponsive, hypotensive, and poorly perfused, then you should consider using electrical cardioversion in order to reestablish normal sinus rhythm. So that's where the machine becomes useful. So that's an example of ventricular tachycardia. And obviously ventricular tachycardia comes with a patient that could be without a pulse or with a pulse. So if it's without a pulse, it's right away you wanna give a defibrillation, which means you're gonna be emitting an electrical shock as soon as you press on these buttons. The difference with an electrical cardioversion is that it is synchronized. What does that mean? It means that actually the machine is going to time the impulse of electricity based on the QRS of the patient. So it's going to try to detect the QRS to make sure that when it's going to give the electrical shock, it's going to give it at a very specific time of the cardiac cycle. Why is it doing this? It's doing this because if you are giving an electrical impulse on a heart that is actually repolarizing, re so it means during the T wave of your, of, your, of your electrical impulse, there's a risk that you enter a malignant arrhythmia. So that's why in the situation of a tachycardia like SVT, you want to use a synchronized cardioversion and not a defibrillation. But if you try to do a synchronized cardioversion in a patient with ventricular fibrillation, the machine will never be able to figure out what is the QRS and will never emit an electrical shock. So here, this is the algorithm of the pediatric tachycardia with a pulse, but potentially with poor perfusion. So if your patient is without a good perfusion, you would obviously do all of your elements that you wanna maximize the ventilation and oxygenation, and then evaluate what's happening with your rhythm. If you detect that there is a probable supraventricular tachycardia and the patient at that point does not look to have some cardiopulmonary compromise, you consider your vagal maneuvers and you can try your adenosine. Usually the adenosine start with a first dose of 0.1 milligram per kilo. As you know, needs to be given as a rapid bolus because it will be metabolized by RBC very, very quickly. Hence why we often give the bolus of adenosine and then the bolus of NS very quickly in a vein that is closer to the heart. The role of the adenosine is to prolong the PR interval. It's actually gonna block your AV node for a few uh, you know, milliseconds so that it blocks the reentry mechanism that usually happens through the AV nodes. And with that, it allows to go back into a normal sinus rhythm. 
Now, if your patient is hemodynamically compromised, poorly perfused and hypotensive, you don't want to be losing time because time is brain. Time is brain oxygen, brain perfusion. So the longer you wait in a patient that's quite unstable to reestablish normal circulatory rhythms, then you are at risk of compromising the oxygenation and perfusion of your brain. So if you have a ventricular tachycardia with a pulse, but your baby's hypotensive with signs of shock, then you should consider right away going towards a synchronized cardioversion. So that's an example of a patient who was uh, in tachycardia and eventually got adenosine and converted. But similarly, you can use a synchronized cardioversion. And contrary to a defibrillation, defibrillation, we usually start two joule per kilo. A synchronized cardioversion, we will start at one joule per kilo. So now I will go back again to my defibrillator and show you how to select the principle of cardioversion. So you've installed your patient. There's one sticker on top. There's one sticker to the back. My pads here are connected to my machine. And then here, I can turn it on. And if my baby's two kilos, well, I want two joule because it's one joule per kilo. So I select two. And then here, there is sync on off. I can charge and then administer the chalk. It will administer a shock by synchronizing it to my patient. So here I want to show I've connected um, the machine with the pads. And the pads are actually on me. And you can see here that my heart rate is at 77, 80 now, 76. In lead select, I have selected pads, but you can select you know, lead one, which means that it would be connected to actually the electrodes of the patient. Lead two, same thing. But what I want is actually my pads, okay? If this would be connected here, it would be only when you're touching the patient that it actually is able to pick up the underlying ECG. So if I was a baby that is one kilo and I would want to do a cardioversion, I would go to two, I would synchronize, and you can see now that actually the machine is picking up my QRS. And by picking up my QRS, it will be able to deliver the shock without delivering it during the T wave, if I charge and eventually deliver. So your pads and paddles are allowing you to actually detect your underlying cardiac rhythm without needing to actually put the electrodes whenever you're in a situation of hurry. So I'm gonna put it off. We're gonna go back. So um, I want to show also um, how to use, if ever you want to use the electrodes of the patient, they're compatible with the machine. So we're going to go on the machine here. And um, this cable is connected here. And then it, it really is looks like a cable, cable for electrodes. And so you can either use the stickers that comes with the machine and connect it to the patient so that it's going to detect the underlying rhythm. Or if there's already electrodes on the patient, you can actually uh, disconnect this and just put your electrodes um, endings and connect them to the machine. And so once you have that and you put the machine on, you would be able to select the leads number two 
so that you're able to pick up actually from the electrodes. If you're only using the pads or the paddles, then you would actually need to go on lead select and, shows, and choose the pads uh, so that it detects uh, the underlying electricity um, in the patient. So for example, since the pads are still connected to me, um, we're gonna redo the example where the pads on, are on me, so I'm the patient. So I'm connecting the ending to the cable. And then this cable is connected to the machine and it's actually detecting that I have narrow QRS complex at uh, a rhythm of 70 per minute. Okay, so we will continue with the presentation and then I'll finish with questions uh, from uh, Julie. Okay, so we spoke about cardioversion. So the cardioversion, as a reminder, is uh, an electrical impulse that will be administered based on uh, your cure, the underlying rhythm of the patient. So it will time it on the rhythm of the patient compared to defibrillation where there's nothing time. It just will deliver a shock right away. Defibrillation is when you have a patient that is pulseless, so no pulse with a shockable rhythm. So the two shockable rhythm are ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Synchronized cardioversion is um, used to deliver the impulse in situations where you have a patient with tachycardia that has some degree of cardiopulmonary compromise. So that could be an SVT, supraventricular tachycardia. It could be a ventricular tachycardia with a pulse, but with poor perfusion. So here you have poor perfusion, cardiopulmonary compromise, then you go with your synchronized cardioversion. So if the patient, um, if the patient is uh, with a clear SVT, you can attempt some of the vagal stimulation or you can give adenosine, which is usually 0.1 milligram per kilo using a two syringe connected with a T connector or a stopcock. You wanna give the adenosine rapidly with uh, a syringe and immediately flush at least five cc of normal saline. So it looks like this. Okay, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable or if the adenosine is ineffective, you wanna perform your electrical synchronized cardioversion. So hemodynamically unstable, think of cardioversion. I think one of the key messages, when you have a patient that's cardiac, patient in which you're starting chest compression, patient in which there's a code that's being called, always think of sending someone to get the defibrillator if you can, because you might need to use it. And if it's far enough in the unit and will cause a delay, this is an undue delay that could have been prevented. So the cardio version will synchronize shocks to patient's native rhythm and will develop, deliver the shock on the R wave. And the defibrillation on the contrary is not synchronized. You wanna use sedation if possible, if the patient is wide awake or if the patient is somehow awake. But if your patient is you know, really uh, unstable, uh, you can deliver your cardio version. So you usually start at a dose of one joule per kilo compared to two joule per kilo for a defibrillation. If it's unsuccessful, then you can increase to two joule per kilo, but you don't wanna go higher than two joule per kilo because it can increase your chances of skin burns and myocardial damage post uh, shock. Um, okay, I wanna finish with the aspect of facing. So think of a baby who's born from a mother with um, maternal lupus. Um, which can be associated with congenital heart block. She presents to the hospital at 36 weeks. The fetal heart rate is found to be 35, so she's going for an emergency C-section. So what do you want to prepare? You probably want to prepare a lot of things for your resuscitation, but one other thing you want to think about is bringing your pacing machine. And possibly, you know, you, you obviously want to have a lot of, of helpers, but you definitely want to have your expert cardiologist uh, come as soon as possible to support you. So that's an example of a patient uh, who has a uh, congenital heart block. Uh, the P waves are following their own rhythms uh, underlying, and then there's an escape rhythm, uh, a kind of rescue rhythm that the ventricle is emitting at a rhythm of 37 that has nothing to do with your underlying P wave rhythm. So you remember, usually you have a P wave that comes from the atrium, usually the right atrium, and it's bringing an impulse that will trigger the rest of the heart to conduct at a certain rhythm. 
as soon as you have a blockage where this atrium is not talking to the ventricles, well, then suddenly the ventricle needs to find a rescue rhythm and you'll have ventricular rhythm behind it that, that kind of triggers. So we fall into the situation of pediatric bradycardia with potential poor perfusion algorithm. So these patients might be born in a situation of severe bradycardia. And sometimes some of these patients showing bradycardia and poor perfusion might need that we reestablish uh, certain cardiac stimulation, which can involve both CPR as well as um, using um, transthoracic pacing. So considering transthoracic pacing. So emergency transcutaneous pacing may be life-saving if bradycardia is due to complete heart block or sinus node dysfunction, unresponsive to ventilation, oxygenation, chest compression, medication, and especially if it is associated with a congenital or acquired heart disease. So maternal lupus uh, can cause fetal acquired heart disease where you can have, for example, a lot of inflammation at your AV node, which can destroy your AV node. And because of that, the impulse coming from the uh, atriums are not getting passed to the ventricles. And hence, because of that, these babies are profoundly bradycardic. Um, so this is an article just for your reference uh, regarding specialized delivery room planning for fetuses with critical congenital heart disease. Um, and then one of the things that you can use to try uh, to force the transmission through the AV node uh, is something called uh, isoproterenol, uh, which is uh, isuprel, and it really uh, tries to accelerate the conduction through the AV node. Now, let's talk about pacing. Um, so the type of pacing can be transcutaneous, transvenous, epicardial, as well as um, via the esophagus. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the transcutaneous pacing. So we will go over some of these parameters, but usually uh, we start with um, the amount of heart rate you wanna aim, the amount of pacer output you wanna have, and then you can start your pacing. So typically in terms of output, we aim between 20 and 40 uh, milliampers. And typically uh, the rate we start is around 100 to 120 in babies. Uh, the standard in adults is 70, and so it's this picture that comes from an uh, adult uh, population, but we would aim for around 100 uh, pace per minute, okay? And so you can increase your pacing and to choose to in order to achieve uh, adequate uh, rhythm in your patient. So I will show you how to use the pacer area in case this is ever needed. So we're going to go back to the machine. And then um, here, what we want to do is in this area, you're going to go manual on. Okay. And within this manual on, you want to go and here click pacer. So we are in the situation where we want the pacer to be on. And within the pacer to be on, you can start pacing here or you can stop pacing here. So obviously right now it's not pacing, especially that it's attached um, to me. So we don't want it to be pacing. And, and you know, it's gonna set right away the amount of um, heart rate you want or pacing per minute and the milliampers uh, you want. So it's default setting of kind of adult settings. So um, we can choose to increase or decrease the output. So let's say we wanna start with our 20 or 25 milliampers. I'm pushing to decrease or I can increase back and go to 40 or here I can go back to 25. And then I can also increase the rate to reach 100. And once I'm ready and happy with my parameters, I can start the pacing by pressing start. So usually for pacing, yes, you can be using both the paddles or the pads, but you can imagine how using the paddles might be cumbersome. Um, and so usually we recommend to put the actual um, pads on the patient, which will transmit uh, the pacing impulse uh, by the machine transcutaneously. Now, one way to see if your output is adequate is that if you're able to generate 100 um, 
pacing per minute, you would expect to find on your pulses, so wherever you're taking your pulses, um, a, a rate of 100 uh, pulsation. So if you have a sat probe, you will measure around 100 uh, beats per minute. And if you're taking the pulse or if you're listening to the heart, you will pick up 100 uh, beats per minute. If you don't pick up any of those, then probably it means that the amount of amperage that you're giving is not enough. And so you would probably want to go up a bit on your amperage. So you would, you would probably um, go to 30. And then uh, based on that, you can measure your hemodynamics by looking at how the baby looks perfused, colored, uh, the blood pressure of the patient, and adjust your heart rate accordingly uh, based on that. So this is how the pacer mode uh, would function. And um, it is useful in situation where you need to have emergency deliveries of, of patients with uh, congenital heart block, such as those that are born uh, from uh, maternal lupus. Now you have to keep in mind that a lot of babies that were born in that setup often will have chronic bradycardia. So many of the babies who are born with 50, 55, 60 of heart rate, um, and have no signs of hydrox, probably have compensated output at the beginning of their life. And probably they won't need pacing, but it's a kind of the baby that if you're going to the delivery room, you want to bring your pacing machine with you so that it's on the side in case the transition does not happen the way you want. Um, the other thing is that if these babies have already signs of high drops and profound bradycardia, then obviously this is a bit more concerning for heart failure and for poor output, and these particular babies may need to have uh, some pacing uh, in the delivery room while we're able to uh, establish a more sustainable way of uh, achieving a normal heart rate. I hope that this uh, workshop was of use. Um, I'm going to open for questions. So, um, Julie, do you have any questions uh, remaining? So I asked you, I think I asked you a question. You, you answered it when you were talking about your algorithm, but just, just so we're, we're clear that um, of the procedure when there is no pulse. So we, we can't rely to start with, with the defibrillation machine. Okay. So let's say you're entering a room um, and you're in a situation where uh, the patient is actually um, very unstable and you pick up that actually there is no pulse. Obviously, your first you know, instinct should be to call a code pink so that you have everyone that comes in. And then without a pulse, you should be thinking of first thing, you need to reestablish a circulatory rhythm because you want to perfuse your brain and your organs. And number two, you want to know, is, is this patient in a situation of an arrhythmia in which I can shock or not shock? So if you don't have a pulse, you need to do CPR so that you're going to take over the function of the heart to provide blood flow to the organs. While you're doing that, you want to make sure that your rhythm is not a ventricular fibrillation or a ventricular tachycardia. If you don't have a pulse and you have a ventricular fibrillation or a ventricular tachycardia, these are the two rhythms that you should be defibrillating. Defibrillating means I am giving an electrical impulse that is non-synchronized. It is not timed on the underlying rhythm of the patient. The machine will give an, electro an, an electrical impulse as soon as I press my button. So if I recognize a ventricular fibrillation or a ventricular tachycardia, and I don't have a pulse, I want to give and deliver a defibril I want to deliver a defibrillation of at least two joules per kilo right away. As soon as you def deliver your defibrillation, you want to restart your CPR. It's not the time to look, oh, do I have a pulse now? What's your rhythm? No, because your heart is stunned. It's probably, even if it's going back into a normal rhythm, it's not going to be an effective contraction of the heart. So you want to restart your chest compressions to have this output, to have this coronary perfusion for two minutes before you start looking for your pulse, your rhythm again. So that's the first thing. If you're in a situation where you have no pulse and you have no ventricular tachycardia or no ventricular fibrillation, this is not the time to do defibrillation because these are non-shockable rhythms. So anything that is not a ventricular tachycardia and not a ventricular fibrillation, you should aim at doing CPR, 
and going on with your algorithms of your other types of disease, pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, um, hypokalemia, hypothermia, hypoglycemia, hyperkalemia, um, and other types of uh, anomalies of the heart, bleeding, hemorrhage, th uh, thrombosis, pulmonary embolus, things like that. Um, so really the idea of giving a defibrillation is really centered on the rhythm of ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. First part. Second part I wanted to talk about today was the cardioversion. Cardioversion means that the electrical impulse that is administered is synchronized. Synchronized on what? On the QRS of the patient. Typically, this is being given in patients that have tachycardias that are unstable and related to supraventricular tachycardia or ventricular tachycardia. If a patient is unstable with a sinus rhythm, it's probably because he has fever, he's in pain, he has uh, other reason, like for example, he's in septic shock, you're not gonna go and do a cardioversion. The ventricular tachycardia is a sinus ventricular tachycardia, which means it varies in time. It's narrow complex, there is P waves versus an SVT tends to have a fixed rhythm, tends to be more than 220, tends to not, you don't see P waves or the P waves are usually retrograde. And these are patients where often the tachycardia is very sudden. It starts very rapidly and you need to think about, you know, what could be the cause of the underlying SVT? Sometimes it's a pick line that's too far and sometimes it's, you know, electrolytes anomaly and sometimes it's other causes. Did I clarify uh, your question, uh, Shubin? So if you have any other questions or things that are unclear, please write to me at gabriel.altit at miguel.ca and I will uh, be very happy to try to clarify further, um, uh, further for your questions. Judy, do you have any other questions? I was just wondering um, why, you know, when we pace, uh, what we usually consider like a normal heart rate would be like, let's say 130, 140. Why do we pace on uh, a baby with a block? Why would we pace from 100 to 110 or 120, which is like, I don't want to say low resting, may 100, yeah. It's a low heart rate. Very good question. So obviously, number one, the amount of electricity that is being transmitted through the skin is not the same thing as having, you know, epicardial pacing. The other reason, um, so, you know, you're, you have to stimulate through your skin and you want to avoid causing burns and giving too much electricity where you enter in a point where uh, it's futile because it's not where you need to reestablish circulatory rhythm. Now, think about a patient who's been in congenital heart block for a prolonged period of time. There's part of the baby or the fetus that has adapted to the slow resting heart rate. If you go too high, it's not necessarily better because a lot of the vascular territory has adapted in terms of cardiac output and rhythm to these lower rhythms. So having 130 or 140 is not necessarily, uh, it's not necessary in, some, in man, many of these patients because they have adapted through, um, through their fetal life. Um, there's also uh, the aspect that uh, once you're going to be putting pacemakers in these small babies, uh, often their rhythms are on the lower side because of battery life. So often these patients will be paced around, you know, 100, 110, because um, you want to avoid having to change uh, the battery all the time uh, for, for these patients. But usually at 100, 110, 120, you should be in a stable place uh, for these patients. So thank you. Hopefully this was useful.